next on Unsolved Mysteries. In Georgia, a secluded lover's lane, a burst of gunfire, and a young couple is executed. But why? Two teenage boys lay motionless in the path of an oncoming train. It seems like an accident until stunning new clues point to murder. At 19, she was the world's highest paid model. At 41, Margot Hemingway was dead. And a man stores a footlocker as a favor to an old friend. What he doesn't know is that it contains a skeleton with a bullet in its skull. Join us for five cases with twists and turns that you can hardly believe. I'm Dennis Farina, and you're watching Unsolved Mysteries. Macon, Georgia. I really missed you. I missed you too. So how about next spring break we go away together, just you and I? Okay. It was a savage double murder. Grant and Michelle were two dean's list students from Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. Tragically, both were killed in a barrage of semi-automatic rifle fire, and no one knows why. I'm starving. I am too. Michelle and Grant had been sweethearts for about eight months when they went out one night for dinner and a movie. Grant was the nicest guy, and he treated Michelle just like gold and would do anything for her. Michelle was very serious about Grant, and she cared for him a lot. I believe that he would have liked to have married her. As Michelle and Grant drove to the movie theater, they were seen by a railroad foreman named John Ambrose. Michelle's white Honda Accord was in the right lane, and Ambrose was next to her, when a blue Honda CRX suddenly swerved in front of him. The blue Honda came up to my left at a high rate of speed and immediately cut back in front of me and cut into the right-hand lane in front of the white Honda and then started slowing excessively. And as I passed it, the driver looked at me like, you know, like, what's up? And it was a light, light-skinned black male and it appeared he had a white male or female in the car with brown hair. The blue CRX continued to slow down, forcing Michelle to drop back. When Ambrose got off the interstate, he lost sight of both cars. But despite what happened on the highway, Grant and Michelle made it to the movies. Afterwards, they drove to a popular scenic overlook at nearby Lake Juliet. In an amazing coincidence, John Ambrose, now with a co-worker, was driving near the lake when he again spotted both the white Accord and the blue CRX. That's odd. Looks like the car I saw earlier. The blue Honda was sitting there beside the road with his parking lights on. Just down the road, Ambrose saw Michelle's car. It was heading in the direction of the parking area at Lake Juliet. I thought it was strange that I saw these two vehicles at two different times within a, you know, three to four hour span that same particular night. Two other eyewitnesses, teenagers who were also parked at the lake, were able to pick up the story where Ambrose left off. They told police that the blue CRX drove into the park around 12.30 a.m. What was that? Turn the music down. Listen. There. 
Moments later, the CRX raced out. Let's go check it out. The next morning, investigators viewed the carnage. There were more than a dozen bullet holes in the car. Michelle and Grant had been killed instantly by semi-automatic rifle fire. Grant was also shot twice in the chest and once in the head with a handgun. Michelle's body had been pulled from the car and dragged nearly 25 feet. Her clothing was left in disarray. It was a very horrendous type crime, something that I've never seen before in, in my tenure of law enforcement. Everything pointed to the blue CRX. Then another witness came forward with a second theory that involved two young men in a white pickup truck. The night of the murders, Stephen Boyd was in the theater parking lot just after Grant and Michelle left the movies. Get out of the car, huh? What are you doing with this Shout guy, huh? Get back in the car. You're being a jerk. I'm being the jerk? Yeah. Some of his custom words were sort of sluttered, and that, that made, me, made, made me feel like he was, he had been drinking a lot. Please just leave us alone, okay? He was trying to make the other guy get out of the car. Because to me, it felt like that used to be, you know, it felt like someone that she used to go with or something, you know? Hey, hey, hey. come on, man. His friend came and told him, said, let's go. It's not worth it. That's when I had noticed that um, this guy had a knife, a gun on the side, because it just literally, it caught my eye. Stephen, I'm going to show you 12 photographs. Police ran a photo lineup for Stephen Boyd. That's him right there. The person that Stephen Boyd had picked out of the photo lineup was a fellow college student, uh, was a friend of Michelle's. Uh, had uh, had a crush on Michelle at one time. He is a very soft-spoken person, but when you introduce alcohol into a scenario, and he's been drinking, then he get he has a very violent temper. Well, he denied that he was in the parking lot when he was confronted with this information. He uh, denied. Uh, being anywhere in the area, uh, the alibi that he had provided us, to this day, we're still unable to eliminate him. He is still suspicious. Hey, hey, hey. come on, man. She ain't worth it. Come on. Now, everything pointed to the young man in the parking lot. But then what about the blue CRX? Something was missing. Connecting the blue Honda CRX and the, uh, the individuals at the parking lot, uh, we have not been able to do that yet. That is one thing that we are hopes to, when we do find this Honda CRX, to see if there is a connection. Update. This case has been solved after years of detective work. The only clues left at the scene were shells from a Colt AR-15 rifle. Investigators checked the records of every pawn shop and gun dealer within 150 miles of Macon, Georgia. They interviewed every single person who had sold or pawned a Colt AR-15. One of the agents found some pawn records on an assault rifle that he was following up. When he followed up those records, that's where he located Mr. Andy Cook. And he, in a routine interview there, interviewed him. And the suspect acting somewhat suspicious made him want to follow that up a little further. And that's how he was developed as a suspect. 22-year-old Andy Cook had owned a Honda CRX similar to the one spotted at the scene. Authorities kept him under surveillance. And within a week, he was arrested on a hunting violation. Later that same day, Cook's father told authorities his son had confessed to the double murder. Slugs from Cook's rifle matched those that had killed Grant Hendrickson and Michelle Cartagena. Cook had a history of mental illness. Grant and Michelle were random targets. 
Andrew Allen Cook was tried and convicted on two counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death. Next, Margot Hemingway's family had a history of suicide. Was her death an accident, or was she destined to die by her own hand? At the age of 19, she was an American icon, the world's highest paid model and a promising actress. Her name was Margot Hemingway. Her grandfather, Ernest Hemingway, was one of the most gifted writers of the 20th century and one of the most tormented. In 1961, at the age of 61, Ernest Hemingway put a shotgun to his head and pulled the trigger. Santa Monica, California. 35 years later, Margot Hemingway was found dead in her apartment. She had overdosed on the prescription drug phenobarbital, which she took for epilepsy. The coroner ruled her death a suicide, even though some disagreed. Tabloid headlines speculated that Margot had fallen victim to the Hemingway curse. She was born in a family that lived on the edge, and many members of the family killed themselves. She grew up knowing that. She understood the Hemingway curse. Margot Hemingway once said that she was, quote, genetically programmed for disaster. Her great-grandfather, Clarence, killed himself in 1928. Ernest shot himself in 1961, and in 1966, Hemingway's sister also killed herself. And then there was Margot. Twice divorced, bulimic, an admitted alcoholic. Is it possible that Margot's death was the result of the so-called curse of the Hemingways? The parallels and links between Ernest and Margot's lives seem to go beyond genetics. I think that Margot internalized the fact that she was a Hemingway with a big H, and she decided to do a lot of the same things that Ernest did. Like Ernest, Margot ran away from home early in life and achieved fame at a young age. As the fabulous babe spokesman for Fabergé perfume, she was a jet-set glamour girl. I think Margot Hemingway got the babe account and became such a supermodel because she really had this spark and this charisma that came across any time you met Margot. You, you just wanted to be with her. But for Margot, fame carried with it a huge burden. The weight that Margot had was trying to live up to everyone else's expectations of what a Hemingway should be. Margot didn't want to have to be what everybody else wanted a Hemingway to be. Margot wanted to be Margot. By 1976, Margot wanted to be an actress. Her first film was the disastrous Lipstick. I hate him! I hate him and I want him to die in jail! I want them to do it to him in jail! It was a stupid, stupid role as a first time. But I do feel the press said, oh, it was all a fraud. This woman is a disgrace. You know, get her off the screen. It was very ugly, the way she was treated. The famous name, which was the way of access before, becomes the bludgeon, almost, that you're beaten with. You haven't lived up to that famous name. Ernest and Margot chose the same means to escape the pressure of fame, alcohol. For Ernest, it destroyed his career. By the late 1950s, he was barely writing at all. Some experts believe that he was also suffering from manic depression. Ernest, however, was never diagnosed, but he underwent electroshock therapy twice during the last year of his life. Margot recognized that she might also be on that same road to disaster. Margot decided to fight her addictions and admitted herself to the Betty Ford Clinic. Margot beat her alcoholism and within months went public with her story. 
a lot of other people in our family have committed suicide. That's also an inherited trait. So I decided to break a family lineage. <laughs> she was one of the few celebrities that I had ever worked with or been friends with that um, just was so willing to expose the most vulnerable, most painful, and potentially the most damaging aspects of her life to the media. On the inside, I was uh, very much alone and very much in pain. She did that in the hopes that it would help as many people as possible break free of their own addiction. But they uh, don't talk about anything emotional. Margot attempted to revive her career, but sadly, without much success. One of her last films was Dangerous Cargo. Professionally speaking, as an actress, she wasn't a problem at all. She was always uh, uh, wanting to have her lines ahead of time. She wanted to be comfortable knowing them. What if this whole story isn't true? She was going to a lot of social functions. Um, she was dating. Her career was going very, very well. She had the promise of several films. She was really on a roll. I talked to her on the phone the Thursday before she died, and she was in a great state of consciousness. There's a period towards the end, right before you commit suicide, where there's a false euphoria. You've really decided to take control of your life. You're very happy. All of your friends think that you're making all the right choices in life. But for you, you know you've decided to die. Although her death was ruled a suicide, Margot's friends still don't buy it. We're pretty clear that it was not suicide, that it was an accidental death from some problem with the epilepsy medication and just somehow taking too much of it. For a lot of people who come up against obstacles and problems, they look to others, they look to friends, they look to relationships, they look to therapists. I think that for some reason, Margot felt she was just like Ernest and had to do it all alone. And that's how she died, all alone. Coming up, two teenagers are killed on a train track in Arkansas, and there's evidence that it was not an accident. Bryant, Arkansas. Just before dawn, a 75-car, 6,000-ton cargo train makes its regular night run. The train is nearly a mile long and is traveling at a speed of 52 miles per hour. Jumping on the rail up there, you see that? Suddenly, engineer Steven Schreier sees something in his path but he cannot tell what it is. As the train gets closer, he sees there are two boys lying motionless across the railroad tracks. From the time that we had placed the train into an emergency position and laid down on the horn, I would estimate about three to five seconds to impact. And uh, that may not sound like a very long period of time, but when you're bearing down on a couple of children, it's an eternity, honestly. The engineer tries desperately to stop the train, but momentum propels it forward. The locomotive travels another half mile. Some 30 cars pass over the spot where the boys are lying. Their bodies are horribly mangled. The two victims are identified as 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives, best friends and popular seniors at Bryant, Arkansas High School. The state medical examiner ruled that the deaths were accidental. They said that the boys had been under the influence of marijuana. Don and Kevin's parents absolutely could not accept that ruling. So they began a crusade to find out what really happened. Well, I couldn't believe that Kevin was knocked out on marijuana or, or into any kind of heavy drugs, anything like that, because I was home a lot during the day when Kevin come in from school and Linda was here at nights, and we'd never seen him in a state that he even act like he was 
you know, spaced out or however you want to phrase it. Kevin and Don were both typical teenage boys. They loved to work on their cars and they loved to hunt. Don was a natural comedian and Kevin was his best audience. The night they were found dead, the two boys left a group of friends around midnight to go back to Don's house. Kevin waited on the porch while Don went inside to talk with his father. And he came in approximately 12, 15. Came to the bedroom and told me where he was going and everything, you know. I told him just be careful and he took one of my spotlights with him, took his 22. Good night. You ready? The two boys set off to go spotlighting, a form of night hunting which is illegal in Arkansas. One of them would shine a light in the animal's eyes, transfixing the prey while the other fired. That night, the boys chose their usual hunting ground along the railroad tracks that ran behind Don's house. Three hours later, the train came speeding down Bryant Hill. When we were about six poles away from it, my conductor yelled out, big hole. I immediately recognized what we saw. It looked like, like a body morgue. It, they were just laid out. The two boys were lying exactly parallel on the tracks, their arms straight down to their sides. According to the train crew, they were partially covered by a light green tarp. Lying parallel to both of them was Don's 22 caliber rifle. Neither boy was moving. And I started laying down on the diesel horn, and uh, I got no reaction, none at all, not so much as a flinch. And the, uh, We just uh, passed over. So why would these two boys lie side by side on the railroad tracks? The state medical examiner said that they had smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes and were in a deep sleep. He said they never heard the oncoming train and he ruled their deaths an accident. Don and Kevin's parents, however, did not accept this scenario. If they were that stoned, how did they lay down in identical positions? That was my immediate reaction to his ruling. We checked the train and it was 98 decimals, which is equal to a jackhammer and air compressor running. I don't think that no one can uh, sleep through that kind of noise. And another thing too, my son's gun, it was laying on gravel. I know my son too well. He would not lay it on gravel. He wouldn't take a chance on the wood getting scratched. We hired a private investigator to try to find out what happened. Every time he would try to find out something, it seemed like he would meet resistance from different authorities and everything, and we weren't getting anywhere. Five months after their sons were killed, the boy's parents held a press conference. Would you like to give up your son and everybody think they was smoked up and laid down, passed out. The day after their press conference, the investigation was officially reopened. Newly appointed prosecutor Richard Garrett had the boys' bodies exhumed for a second autopsy by a noted expert. This doctor concluded that together the boys had smoked not 20, but between one and three marijuana cigarettes. He also found evidence that one boy was already dead and one was unconscious before the train ever hit them. A grand jury reversed the medical examiner's original finding of accidental death and officially ruled that the boy's deaths were probable homicides. Prosecutor Garrett then focused on the green tarp reported by the train crew. Neither boy owned one. So, who covered them with it? and why. All four of the people on the train who were able to observe 
the scene prior to the accident, stated that the boys were partially covered by a green tarp. Fine, I'll go ahead and call them in. However, police who searched the scene later denied that Engineer Schreier had even told them about the green tarp. They even questioned his existence. That, to me, would be like questioning the existence of the boys on the track. Covered up the tarp. Okay, well, because what's real is real and what's not is not. And that's, you know, it was there as well as the boys. I can understand two people laying down on a railroad track. I can understand two people laying down and cover themselves up with a tarp. Where would the tarp come from? I am convinced that the tarp existed. The tarp, however, was never found. And then another intriguing lead. One week before the boys were killed, a man wearing military fatigues was spotted near the train tracks. His behavior aroused suspicion. When police officer Danny Allen stopped to question the man, he opened fire. I got up from the seat, the subject was gone. And five minutes later, Saline County showed up and we searched the area and never found a subject. On the same night that Kevin and Don died, witnesses again reported seeing a man in military fatigues. This time, he was heading down a road less than 200 yards from the spot where the boys' bodies were found. Police were unable to locate him. Then, investigators turned up a strangely similar case in the town of Hodgwin, Oklahoma, about 130 miles away. There, two young men were lying side by side on the railroad tracks in a position nearly identical to Kevin and Don's. They also remained motionless as a train approached and then ran them over. I think that someone took these boys' lives. What I'm hunting for is the reason why they did it. I've never carried a gun in my life, uh, but since we've started working on this thing, I am carrying a gun. Uh, because I do feel like that, that uh, my life could be in danger at some point in time. I basically think that they walked up on something that they was not supposed to see. They was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I know in my own mind that they was murdered and put there. Update. Since we broadcast this story, Don Henry's t-shirt has been analyzed by an expert pathologist. Cuts in the fabric indicate that Don was stabbed before the train ran over him. In the light of this new evidence, the grand jury changed its ruling from probable homicide to definite homicide. If you have any information about the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, the discovery of a skeleton in an old footlocker with a bullet in its skull. Thermopolis, Wyoming. A longtime resident moves away and leaves behind some of his belongings. Included is an old lock trunk in his shed. He asks a friend named Newell Sessions to look after it. Six years go by. Newell can't take the suspense any longer. Let's just see what's in here. No telling what we'll find. I doubt if we'll find much of anything. Uh-oh. My goodness, it's a skeleton. Nobody could believe that we had uncovered a human skeleton. And they wasn't too much said at that time. I think it was my wife asked me what we was going to do with it. And I said, I think that the best thing we could do with it would be to take it out here and dig a hole and give it a proper burial. Newell's wife told him that he better call the sheriff. But before he did, Newell contacted the friend who had left the trunk. We'll call him Gabby. So what's up? You remember that shed you left up here? I sure do. 
Gabby told Newell that he'd never even opened a damn thing. He thought he remembered buying it at a garage sale. But when it came to the time and place, Gabby's memory failed him. Well, when I cut the lock off, I found a human skeleton in the trunk. You're uh, not serious about this, are you, Newell? He acted uh, probably as surprised as I did when I opened the trunk that he couldn't believe it. He thought I was kidding him. And I told him, no, I'm not kidding you. There is a human skeleton in there. Then Newell contacted Sheriff Lumley, who was immediately suspicious. I've talked to a lot of people about this case, and everybody said almost 99.99% or more that they would have opened it immediately upon purchasing it. They said if they went to a yard sale or garage sale, bought a trunk, that's half the excitement. It's like a Christmas present. Can't wait to get home to open it. I took the thing home. I didn't have a hacksaw. I was going to cut the lock off. And that's a lot of work. Two days later, a bombshell. X-rays revealed a bullet was lodged in the skeleton's skull. Now it seemed that the sheriff had a murder on his hands. Where did you buy the trunk at, Gabby? Oh, I guess it was... Uh... Gabby was uh, unsure about the details. He said he might have bought the trunk in Wyoming, or Iowa, or Illinois, or maybe even Oklahoma. And it might have been as early as 1973, but then again, maybe not. What do I have to worry about? I mean, really, you know, I know I didn't do the guy. You know, I didn't shoot this dude. Uh, I'm barely, in fact, I'm not, I'm not even as old as the gun that shot him. Gabby is, is in his mid-40s. The footlocker and the lock were made back in the 30s time period. I don't believe that Gabby was, was the person that caused the death to this person but my thoughts have always been that he has knowledge of who the person in the trunk is or where they came from. Sheriff Lumley turned the skeleton over to the Wyoming State Crime Lab in Cheyenne. Okay, well, let's start laying it out. He was in his 50s to uh, mid-60s, probably stood about 5'8", plus or minus an inch and a half. Um, was a Caucasian male. The bullet was from a 25 caliber weapon that was produced in the uh, early 1900s, 1904, and then available in the United States about 1908. Also found in the trunk was a rotted plastic bag from a supermarket chain. The bag wasn't even manufactured until the early 1950s. At the crime lab, Sandra Mays created a three-dimensional facial reconstruction out of clay. Only the eyes and hair are guesswork. Otherwise, there should be a good likeness of the man who somehow got a bullet in his head. So, who is this man and how and why did he die? The old trunk appears to have been used by someone in the U.S. Armed Services between World War I and World War II. If you have any information about the skeleton with a bullet in its skull, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, see how your tips brought two long-lost sisters together for the first time. are snapshots from another place and another time. A proud young father cradles his newborn daughter. Virginia Burns always thought that these were photos of her. And then after her father died, Virginia's mother revealed the truth. The little girl in the pictures was in fact Virginia's half-sister and her name was Susan. It turns out that Virginia's father had a previous marriage. Daddy's going to miss you. But circumstances and a long-standing dispute with his mother-in-law had forced him to leave his wife and his baby daughter, Susan. I'm sorry, Joe. In later years, his attempt to locate them were unsuccessful. My mother admitted that she didn't tell me to protect me. 
She had no way of knowing where my sister was and why tell me if there was no way I could meet her. Looking back, Virginia suddenly understood the significance of one particular incident from her childhood. For her sixth birthday, Virginia's parents gave her a doll. So what are you thinking of your doll, sweetie? I love her. She's beautiful. Well, what's her name? I don't know. What do you think I should call her? He says, why don't you call her Sweet Sue? How about Sweet Sue? And I did, not realizing that that was the name of my sister. She needs to know she has a father who loved her. And secondly, I have a sister out there, and I'm more than ready to be a sister. Update. On the night of our broadcast, Bethina Susan King from Oklahoma City called Unsolved Mysteries and identified herself as Virginia's sister. They spoke on the phone and made plans to meet. When she came walking out those doors, I knew her instantly. I, I just knew that's my sister. I was really nervous. I didn't know what to expect. Ben and Jenny was holding this huge sign that says, desperately seeking Susan. And I had planned on just walking by to see if she would recognize me, but I couldn't. I got to her and dropped my suitcase, and we hugged and cried and kissed and hugged some more and just fell in love with her instantly. The doll that had stood in for Susan for so many years now had a special meaning for both women, a tangible reminder of their father's love. I knew it was a gift from our dad to her, but I also felt like at, this, at that moment that it was mine too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's fun. It's fun. In 1948, a tragedy was about to unfold just north of Tipton, Oklahoma, and a family was about to be torn apart. You coming home after work today? Lee Stallings, his wife Leela, and their six children live in poverty in an old school bus. Lee, who worked as a sharecropper, was rarely home, and he gambled away what little money he brought in. In his own way, he was fatherly by trying to make a living for us. But as far as being home, he wasn't home that much. The mother was the one that was the disciplinarian to cooking the food and supplying the meals and everything. It was mother's job. We always had something to do. And we had toys to play with and each other to play with. So it, we don't, we didn't think of ourselves as being different. Do you want to hear the story of Noah's Ark again? Yeah. OK. The old school bus was home, a safe haven for the six children. The baby was two-year-old Norma Ruth, and the oldest, Roy, 14. Mary was 12, the oldest girl. There were three more brothers, Michael Joseph, nine years old, Ernest Lee, six years old, and four-year-old David Ray. The bus is gone. The family faced a sudden crisis when the old school bus was taken away. Lee lost it in a poker game. Neighbors contacted child welfare authorities who hauled Lee and Leela into court. Mr. and Mrs. Stallings, at this time, you are placed in the custody of the Tillman County Sheriff's Department. I remember seeing them both in handcuffs. And that was the last time I saw Mother as they let her out the side door. Over the next few days, the Stallings children were all taken to foster homes. I told Ernest to get in the car, and I put David in the car, and Normie was holding on to me and wouldn't let go, and they pulled her out of my arms and put her in the car. You go in the house. Ernest Lee was pulling at the window. They had rolled the windows up. That's the last time I saw them. This court, there is you. 
Within a week, the charges against Li La and Li Stallings were dropped, but the damage had already been done. The Stallings were told that four of their children, all but Roy and Mary, had been put up for adoption. Michael Joseph was the first to be reunited with the family. By then, he was a young man with the adoptive name Joe Thomas. After Leela's death, Mary and Joe Thomas still desperately wanted to find their surviving brothers and sisters. Update. The day after our broadcast, a man named Lee Shulian of Owasso, Oklahoma, called us and identified himself as Ernest Lee Stallings. Even though he was only six years old when the family split apart, Lee knew that he had several brothers and sisters and also remembered living in a bus near a river. Three weeks later, Lee arrived at a hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to be reunited with his brother, Joe. The two have not seen each other in nearly half a century. I really didn't know how I was going to react. Uh, you know, we've been separated for 46 years. I uh, felt a lot better than what I thought I might. And I was really, you know, felt real good to, to hug him. We've already started making uh, some plans to get together and go fishing. <laughs> so we've got a future ahead of us to uh, be together and enjoy each other. Joe, Mary, and Lee eventually located two more siblings, David and Norma Ruth, whose adoptive name is Dee. All surviving siblings have now been located. While we are delighted with the heartwarming reunion, not all of our cases are solved. If you have any information about the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, or the mysterious skeleton found in Thermopolis, Wyoming, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. <laughs>